Hi, I'm Theo Dorgan, and I'm very disappointed that when this festival night is over, we won't be going down to Joe Mays. This is a terrible sadness to me. Of course, it's wonderful to be back. This is a great festival. And um, I have a particular fondness for Scurries because my beloved Paula's equally beloved uncle, Wally, is, as far as I can make out, the unofficial mayor of Scurries. So I dedicate the reading to Uncle Walter. Walter Meehan, sit up straight. Good man. I thought I'd start with a very old poem. Um, and it's one of those odd things that if you you're to, to a young poet, it's a bit of a shock when it comes in all in one piece. And 30 or 35 years later, I'm still wondering what it means. But if it tr the truth is, I don't really care. I mean, why should we worry about what poems mean? I mean that's for other people to worry about. 4,000 survivors. The horse of the century trembles under the alder tipped with bronze, flanks of black silk raked by thorns. He has made a long flight in terror, fleeing the sea of millions dead to this place of water beneath tall cliffs, thicket of sun, swell of birdsong. His shadow creeps east to his birthplace as evening ignites. Rearing his head among branches, he flails the close turf, nostrils flung wide to the savour of earth, then plunges to part the green waters, shouldering out, hooves clattering on submerged rock, white roar of the waterfall in his ears. High on the cliffs, the assembly lifts to depart. Young men put on the wings of eagles. Women already are treading air. A clear bell note fractures the horizon. And sometime around then, maybe a little later, when Mechanigan and myself were running the Cork Film Festival. I used to go to Moscow every year for the film festival. And one night, <coughs> going back to the hotel, passing through Zerzinskaya Square, where the KGB headquarters were, a young bride and her groom went flashing past, she in her white dress. And I'm think I was thinking of Anna Akhmatova and her rec great poem, Requiem, and the darkness out of which Russia had come. This was before it descended into a new kind of darkness, I suppose. It's called At the Lubyanka. No cues yesterday, Anna Akhmatova, at the black ice-bound gates of Cresty Prison. Tonight, a bride in a veil of lace walks hand in hand with her young man through Grimm's Yerzinskaya of eternal shame without a backwards or a sideways glance. The bell of her laughter antiphon to your requiem. Now that the terror has changed key, now that it drifts like ash, like funeral music through the veins of the wide world, tell me, where will the grief of mothers find the point of its pure expression? Where should we hope to find now a voice like yours? Because, of course, the grief goes on, the grief goes on, and all sorts of things go on. Orpheus, as a figure uh, for, the, for poetry and for music, has proved a very long-lived and enduring Greek myth. And it's one that's, that's stayed in my mind on and off over the decades. And a couple of years ago, I published a book called Orpheus. And it's in two parts. And the first part is, I suppose, a meditation on the eternal recurrence of the lyric singer. It traces the life story of a young man who begins doing cover versions of songs by Dylan, Joni Mitchell, what have you, and ends up writing his own, propelled into his own gift by grief, I suppose. Um, I thought it was wonderful when Bob Dylan was given the Nobel Prize because it honored the unbroken lyric tradition. It was funny to see people tying themselves up in knots about it. Um, they've completely forgotten the history. We were always lyric singers. Some do it with our voice, some do it with a guitar. But the lyric impulse, the Orphic impulse, is undying. The second part of the book imagines Orpheus, as you remember, I'm sure, was torn apart by the Minads and his body cast into the sea. Uh, his head later floated ashore on, on the North Cape of the island of Lesbos. Um, but I imagined, if you want to call it imagining, maybe I simply saw Orpheus reborn, remade back then, um, but this time, 
slightly sobered, not so full of himself, this time realizing that you can keep the gift and live in the world. So this section is a short section. I just thought it captures that moment where he's beginning to realize that he has been reborn to a new purpose of himself. Back in the long before, I was enchanter and arrogant with the gift. I could make stones move. Men made me famous for it with their talk, muttered sorcerer as I passed, silently crowding to my heels. And I confess I liked it, the awe they felt, a kind of sustaining echo to my own, cold air to anneal the cold blade of thought. Now I am found enchanted. The song sings me and gives me pause. The God intends this, such has been made known. Reborn in silence, I have recanted belief in my power, surrendered my one art to itself. By sea, by cliff, by woods I walk, tending the busy music of what happens, entranced with my part. And of course, just a little way back down the coast and being either on Hoth Head, um, is where I always imagined Fionn McCool giving that famous answer when Oscar and Oshin asked him, what is the finest music in the world? And Fionn said, the music of what happens. I think one of the reasons I like Orpheus, or this new version of Orpheus that I might say has been revealed to me, is this understanding that I think I wish more people engaged with the craft would be open about that we don't write the poems poems write us and the trick is to be open to the poems and then you bring the craft in. I've never understood this idea of a career in poetry. It gives me the shivers when I hear people talking about their careers in poetry. I think you have a life in poetry if you're lucky. It's not called a gift for nothing. You can't buy it or own it. Um, one of the great poets of the 20th century of course is Federico García Lorca and a not so long ago, that wonderful musician Cormac Brannock had the happy idea of celebrating Lorca's centenary by um, putting together a show of music and poetry. That fine poet Keith Payne did some fresh translations of Lorca into English. I did some into Irish at Cormac's request. And then with a mix of Irish and Spanish music, we put a show together and took it on tour. So in the Residencia in Madrid, um, after the reading, which was electric, it was the reading and the performance of the music, which was an electric occasion, I was astonished by the number of people who came up to speak about the translations of Lorca into Irish. And the general tenor of what they were saying was, in all of the translations, and they were learned people and steeped in Lorca and in the lore and learning about Lorca, said so they'd never heard him translated in a way that brought the duende, that sense of vitality and passion, which was intrinsic to the original, out into another language, but they heard it in Irish, which I think only four people in the 350 or so at present had actually even heard Irish, let alone spoke it, including our wonderful ambassador, Sheila Maguire. Parenthesis, I think we are so well served by our ambassadors. I wish more people knew. Anyway, I came home and felt that, oh God, fake yassa. And I felt obliged to, see what could be done about putting more of Lark into Irish, and he ended up translating the Gypsy Ballads, the Romancero Gitano, into Irish. Bits of them and portions of them had been translated before by Marla Wachanthi from back down the coast in Hope, and by the late great Mihola Hartnade and Michael Hartnett. But I don't think anybody had done the entire Gypsy Ballads into Irish before. And I'm a little hesitant about writing in Irish because I'm not as steeped in it as I am in English, and I haven't put in the 10,000 hours. But I thought I might be forgiven for revisiting the, after all, it was the language of my childhood and the language of my schooling. And um, I thought, well, if it didn't work, nobody would publish it, but Kushkem did, so there must, it must be at least passable. I just thought I'd read uh, Romance 13, Mar of Le Gras, Dead of Love. Cadishin eg lunre in snodorkli orde, dridan dorosavach ta hendiak bulte, imhuile in anion mavien ta kere lochre neg jalru, nadini shin ni falard excure a gopper. 
Onke garloeke arget eg ege, folk fun fadan de galli eg dull de kroche en uus er natur bui, knagen an ihe er krite, er fani glinne na balkoin, mile gaird er retor nach na hniani, bolle fiena agus omre eg chachtos na durchli. Lohani fluch a cana agus rofle shanaglor eg fuimnu tri arsha brishta an van ihe. Davana is Roshna in a gulla in Snadurchli a wine, Keras Silsha ex Gradil, Le Fornar San Jorge, Mana Bronacha Naglana, Egumprigenus, a quid full of farul, co sov le blog yarha, co sharav le carol nog. Shanvana on a hon, beer the be a queen eg bonachanic, no made dochrasnaha, danamanacha, the gruik. Eigene eldata irgene verlune ad ihe kernachus bon. Vi serafini agus gifog eg shenem ergardini. Awaher, nor a iam boss, lig is son eg nehushle. Shol strangskel de gorma o has is o huig. Schacht gien de schrad de ill. Schacht gien de forpini dubelte. A vrishna skaha in tevnache in sne shomri kadrev durche. Lan gabel la lava scarha, was coron vioga blahana, be murn the mionic fuimnu gutrain nyader cain ait, the flanken spare the horse, a rofle garagach na forisha, fe marvi salsha ex gradil in snadurchli orda. It's extraordinary how the, the sound pattern of one language can uh, evoke. Uh, that of the language you're translating from. And there are many very fine translations of Lorca, but, you know, that's what people said. It was when they heard it in Irish, they heard the original passion. So, interesting, eh? Hmm. I thought I'd read some new poems, some poems that um, haven't been published yet. Um, so this is um, this, the new book, if it ever gets finished will be an, at, um, an excavation, an archaeological expedition into my primary school days. And I think what prompted it was flashes of memory, remembering how, as a child, I felt my mind opening, my grasp of language improving, my perspective on the world shifting and changing. And I thought it would be interesting to open myself to those memories and see how they might speak themselves so this is very much a work in progress, and um, the finished product may be very different to this, so it's tentative. I'm feeling my way into it. But I think it's fair in a festival to um, not to be simply presenting people with the polished, finished things. Sometimes it's, in, it's of interest. It gives an insight into the work of poetry to, to see something at a tentative stage, perhaps. So two sections, two very separate sections. And the first is just barely starting infant school. The second one, he's learning to read, which would be obvious. So the first one. Then he's just spent his first week in the infant school, OK? Then we have to go back again on Monday. My dad is putting his bike into the shed. I don't think I'll bother going back, I say. He sits on his heels and looks at me. Back where, he says. School. Oh. Why is that, he asks. Well, to be honest, it isn't very interesting. He starts roaring laughing. And so does my mom, Aunt Angela, Uncle John. I don't understand, but it makes me angry and confused. You just have to knuckle down, he says, ruffles my hair and takes a wrapped sweet from his pocket. When they've gone inside, I squat on the hot concrete and grind my knuckles into the ground. I learn nothing from this except that it hurts. Why tell me something that makes no sense? And the second piece. When you learn to read, everything changes forever. Now, I am not in the room if I don't want to be. Now I can have a dog, a rich father and mother. We can have a car, apple trees, a stream in the garden. Now I can be in other places where everything comes out right where men have horses and guns and swords and boys are always winning their fights. The sun shines, and when it rains, there are big log fires and mugs of cocoa. 
There are rivers for catching fish and high mountains to climb. Long trips by train through fields of corn or dark forests or journeys by sea. These I like best of all with the wind howling and all the sails big and white and full of the wind. And the boy is brave. He steers the ship by the big wheel all through the storm with the captain by his side and never once, not even once, is he afraid. And it isn't all made up like the stories my dad reads out to me. I can read about stars, jungles, dinosaurs, other countries and what grows there, what people do, what an orchestra is and what makes an engine work, the names of places, India, Russia, China, Japan, where people wear clothes that are different from ours and where they eat strange food. Maybe best of all is that I remember what I read. It all goes on. When the clock is moving so slowly, when I've done my sums and I'm staring out the window, fidgeting and trapped, I can be back in yesterday's book, riding my pony with cowboys, or driving a race car, or hiding from pirates in a cave, and if Miss Coffee doesn't catch me dreaming, free as a seagull. And I'll finish then with the most recent poem I've written. It's, um, it was a birthday poem for my beloved on her 65th birthday for Paula. Child of Time. I watch as you cup a potted seedling and lift the thin stalk trembling, your hands closing over to protect it from the breeze. Why time should stop at moments like this, I do not know. You cup in the same hands with the same gesture the warm, downy head of your infant nephew, raising the tender skull to the light of morning, and the kitchen clock hesitates between tick and tock. Did time stop for the midwife cradling your head? Did your mother, hand on your fragile neck, pause to gaze down the halls of what will become your life? Did she smile, bending to uncover a breast to wish for her first daughter, a free and untroubled path through the turbulence of the world, a garden in which a grown woman you might take your ease. Perhaps she foresaw a succession of stepped moments, moments like these, here, now, when you appear at my side, silent and peaceful, as I sift for gold and the long life we have spent together and your hand floats out to cup my head, and it happens again. Time stops, and it is the moment we first met, you standing there before me, long vistas of promise opening on a Georgian street, the sudden certainty of being cradled in great hands, held up to the sun.